Well, a pleasant good Sunday morning to all of you. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Um, now, weather like this, you'll find people out strolling or running, exercising, and then some people would like to be in church. Good day to praise the Lord for all that he has done for us. Um, thankful that we didn't have bad weather our way, no tornadoes or anything like that, but um, I left home on Friday night because I thought the weather was going to be bad there in Kansas. I didn't want to get into it anyway. And I got here at 11 o'clock and it was dry and nice. We have, we have so much to be thankful for, so much. Um, I am thankful personally for my salvation. Um, maybe many of you don't know anything about me, my background, where I came from. Um, I really did not get out into the world of sin, but I was a sinner. But the Lord has saved me from quite a lot. He brought me out from quite a lot. And um, I don't know if uh, y'all were acquainted with my testimony, but um, I was a Catholic girl and uh, very good Catholic. I believed everything. And um, I was not satisfied, even as a young child, I was not satisfied because at that time, everything in the Catholic Church was, was done in Latin. You go to church, and I don't know Latin, but everything that was said and done in Latin, it was rather confusing. And the Lord, he knows our hearts. He, he knows that I was hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And God does everything right in the right time. I got communed and I got confirmed. I went to the confessionals. I confessed my sins I, to the priest. I wanted to go to heaven. I wanted to go to heaven so badly that I'll go to the confessional and we had a little book, a little prayer book, and it had a list of your sins, list of the sins that a person could commit. And you had the mortal sin, which was the really bad one, and you had the venial sin, which was a little sin. But I so wanted to go to heaven so badly, I didn't want to miss out on any. Whether I committed them or not, I wanted to be sure the priest forgave my sins. Um, I think I probably was about 11 or 12 when I was getting really serious about salvation, or I didn't know what to call it, but there was a hungering and a thirsting. And so I went to the confessional I could remember and I started reading out all the sins to the priest. Well, I don't think anybody here was Catholic, but in the confessional, he could see me, and I really cannot see him. I kneeled there, and there was like a, a net or something between us, and I'll read all the sins. Um, um, the, the biggest sin that you could commit, according to the Catholic Church, is missing Mass on Sunday. So if you miss Mass on Sunday, that's a big sin. Of course, murder will come in, in there. And uh, then they had the list of fornication and adultery and stealing and lying and all these things like that. Well, I didn't know what fornication and adultery was, but I told him that I committed them. And uh, it depends on how badly you sin, 
then you have to go and pray and he will send you to pray before the, the statue of either the Virgin Mary or Saint Joseph or somebody. And uh, do you know what a rosary is? Do you, you know what the rosary is? It's like beads and uh, you have the cross at the beginning and, and then you have these beads that you have to roll and pray. Well, if you're really a bad sinner, uh, you get to, to say so many of the Lord's Prayer, which we call the Our Father. You have to say so many of them, and you'll kneel there and your knees will start hurting. And uh, so many of um, the Apostles' Creed and so many of the Hail Mary. Well, uh, I know the priest knew I didn't commit those sins. I never, I don't think he ever gave me a, a bad one. He didn't give me, he just say go and say this sort of number of Hail Marys and all that stuff like that. Later on, as we were getting older, we were really good friends of the priest. We were, say, good Catholics. He suggested that we go into the nun. We, we become nuns. At that time, it was three of us girls. And I really wanted to become a nun because there were privileges in that, that you get to go and study. They'll send you to the nunnery, yes, but they will give you your education, and it's free, and I wanted that. Well, at that time, many of the young girls were going into the nunnery. Um, they didn't have intentions of remaining. They thought they will get the qualifications and come out and get a secular job, you know, teaching or something. But, uh, you know, God sent the missionaries at the right time. I am so thankful that God is in control of your life and of my life. And the scripture says he knows us from the beginning. He knows us even before we were born. And he has a plan for us. We just have to let him have his way in our lives. And the missionaries came, and, and I think that same year, Brother August left, and the six of them came down, Brother and Sister Cawthon, Bonis, and Anna, and Cecilia, six of them and they held revivals in Grenada. Well, that was about the time I got saved. That time I was very young though, and I didn't understand what we studied this morning about being saved and being sanctified. And uh, the devil um, has a way of pulling young people back. If we, we do not understand, we do not know all those things. We really didn't have a church to go to I think the missionaries came up on a, like a Friday evening or so on. We didn't have, have any place to go to on Sundays. But you know, I am so thankful that we serve a God that we don't quite understand him. We don't. We don't understand how a God that we cannot see could take care of your spiritual needs and your physical needs and everything else. And that is why many people do not trust in him. Had he been someone we could see and run to every time and take our problems to him, we probably might have more faith in, you know. But folks, he is there. We just cannot see him. But if we reach out, we can touch him. We just have to believe that he's there. His presence is here. So we need to believe him. The cares of this life, the rescuing of people in a tornado. God, we cannot see him, but he intervened. Even if the house is damaged and, and things happen, but lives were saved. We serve a God who cares for us and he tries to get our attention at times and sometimes we let him down as Christians. 
But I just want to encourage us this morning, as Christians in this life, in this world, we, we look around and we see things happen and we wonder, well, why didn't God act any sooner? God acts in his time, not in our time. I am so thankful for him today. Um, what I really had in mind today, and I, and I pray that the Lord will help me to, to bring it out, is um, in the book of Jude, um, in the book of Jude, uh, verse 1, um, it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Wow, that's three things here. Sanctified by God the Father, preserved by Jesus and called those who are sanctified. He has a lesson for us. In verse 3, it says, um, it is needful, he said in verse 3, it is needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he's calling for the sanctified people. He's calling for the church to honestly contend for the faith that was once delivered by the apostles. He handed it to them and they delivered it to us. So what is it? What is it that, uh, that we have to contend for? He says, uh, because there are certain men who crept in unawares when we did not know, when we were not paying attention, when we were sleeping, when we became careless. And he says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, he called them ungodly men, turning the grace of our God in lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and one Lord Jesus Christ. So he's calling on us, those who are sanctified, to be aware, to be aware that there are people who might be coming among us and they are not of us and they want to destroy us. In uh, somewhere around the years 1555 to 1558, there was a, a queen and she was nicknamed Bloody Mary. And the reason she was called Bloody Mary, it's because she killed a lot of people. She was a Catholic, and there were at that time what we call Protestant reformers. They were looking into the word, they were searching the scriptures, they saw that what the Catholic Church was teaching was not right. And one of the main issues was they were teaching that whenever you take the host or the bread and you break it and the priest prays over it, it turns into the real body of Christ. And the blood, the wine turns into the real blood of Christ. Well, these reformers were teaching at that time, that's not so. That does not happen. This is just a symbol. It's not the real body and blood of Christ. Well, as a little girl in the Catholic Church, I believed that it was the real body and blood of Christ. That's why before we 
took communion, we had to go to confession to be sure that we were pure and ready to accept um, what the priest was giving to us. Well, at that time, she had about 300 of them burned at the stake. 300 of those reformers. And that's one reason she was called Bloody Mary. And if you ever um, read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you will see some of these names um, who were burned at the stake at that time. These men who were burned at the stake, they were contending for the faith. They gave their lives for what they believed. As Christians today, we have to know what we believe and how we can contend for it. We have so many people, as we were talking about this morning, they don't understand sanctification. Somebody will come up to them and say, well, um, if you're sanctified and filled with the Spirit, you have to speak with tongues. That's not so. We have to know what we have within us. We have to know. There was a time in my life when I was really digging and, 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 and begging the Lord, please, Lord, if this is so, let me experience it. I've been to Pentecostal churches. In fact, I, I started going to the Pentecostal church before I became holiness because as I said there was no holiness churches where I could attend. Even when I came to the States, I went to Assembly of God before I found the holiness church. But I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if this is real, let me experience it. I never did experience it. And no one should come and doubt whether I have the Holy Spirit or not. If I didn't have it, folks, I would not be here today. The Lord has led my life. The Lord has blessed me. The Lord has directed me. And all the praises belong to him. And so, if we know what we have is right, then we got to contend for it. We have to stand up for it. Or we will be wiped out. And that's what the devil wants. 2,000 years ago, the Lord himself delivered the doctrine to his disciples. And when I talk about contending for the faith, I'm not talking about the Bible Holiness Church. I'm talking about what was handed down by the Lord himself to these, his disciples. And he said, go ye into the world and teach it and preach it and make disciples. And what did he teach them? And we all know it and we accept it. One, we believe in the virgin birth. Two, Christ came and died and rose again, according to the scriptures, for our salvation. Three, we believe in heaven and hell. We believe that Christ is coming back again to judge the quick, to judge the dead. We, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. We believe in sanctification. We believe in everlasting life, whether it's in heaven or it's hell, in hell. Everlasting damnation. We believe in the word of God. So our faith and what we contend for is not our doctrine. It's not really the doctrine of the holiness church. It's not how you dress and, and uh, um, how you do your hair or whether you wear hose or whether you wear sandals. Or, that's not what the, the Lord wants us to contend for. He wants us to contend for the spiritual things, spiritual things. 
I'm not going to argue with people about uh, how long their clothes might be or how, you know. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why. I agree with my doctrine, the doctrine of the Bible Holiness Church. I agree with it. I try to live by it. But uh, there was a time that uh, Sister Woman explained a lot of things to me that when she went to New Guinea, and if you've been around Sister Woman, she has a holy eye. I mean, she won't look twice at anything that's not good. She said, but there were naked people in New Guinea. That's their culture. The Lord saved them. And she said, they'll get missionary burials and she would, they would give the clothes to the people. But they were so careful not to dirty the clothes that they will pack them away for special occasion and they'll still wear the leaves around them and no clothes. Now, what I'm saying is, we will condemn them and say, they cannot be Christians and, and dress that way. Or you'll go to another country where the people, let me put it this way, I went to school without shoes, so, for a missionary to come to Grenada and ask me where is my hose, that's a different question. You understand what I'm getting at? That's not salvation. That is not salvation. But I believe if you teach them, you show them the right way, they will eventually line up. But we are not here to line up people. That's not why God sent the disciples. He sent them so they could preach the gospel and get people ready for heaven. That's the mission, and that's why we have to contend for the faith that was handed down to us from the disciples, and that never changed. What is written in God's word and what the Lord handed down to the disciples never change and never will change because that's his word. So it says, if then what the disciples handed down to us was precious and we call it the pearl of great price, we have to contend for it. If you have diamonds and you have pearls and you have that at home and a, a robber comes to rob you of that thing, you're going to fight for it because it's precious. Christians today, if ever than before, we need to be standing up and letting the world know that we are on God's side contend for it. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 3 verse 17 it says, in the last days men will not endure sound doctrine. Many false teachers shall appear with false doctrines and will deceive many. And if it were possible they will deceive the very elect. You know, we have people coming around and they know how to sweet talk. They know how to convince people. And we have many people with itchy ears. They want to believe something easy. Oh, it's not what these people say. You could do that and still be a Christian. No, if the Lord says no, it's no. When we become a Christian, everything about us is changed. We were talking about that this morning. Your walk is changed. Your talk is changed. You know, Jacob, when he returned to, to his father's house, when he was going back to meet his brother, he was a different Jacob because he met the Lord and the Lord changed his walk. You remember, he touched his side and Jacob wasn't able to walk. And 
he changed his stock and he changed his name. When you meet the Lord, he brings about the changes. We cannot do those things within ourselves. The scripture tells us to try the spirits, see whether they are of God or not. If we are children of God, his spirit will witness with ours. We should be able to discern whether those teachers are of God or not. Anyone who denies Jesus is the son of God is a false prophet. Peter, the apostle, pointed Jesus out to the world. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He pointed Christ to us and we are supposed to direct others into what they should believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Um, Peter knew what it was to learn about song doctrine and to preach it. And uh, we are to love it. If you have it, you tell it, you stand for it, you defend it, you contend for it because it is good, it is true, it is right, and it is just. So today the world is fighting over so many things. Well, we as Christians know we're going to leave those so many things behind. Only what is done for Christ will last. He is depending on us as soldiers of the cross to defend his word. He is depending on us. We do not have to shy away. We do not have the world to say we are winners. As Christians, we will always be on the winning side because there are more with us than be with them. We might look few in numbers, but the power is on our side. The power is on our side. Never forget, never forget. It's only a third of the angels fell from heaven. We have a whole two thirds on our side. We cannot count them because we do not know the numbers. But when God created them, he created them everlasting. They don't die out. They don't die out. And they're always on our side. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you need more power? Do you need more armies than what God has? God has a people, and we are going to stand for him. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Put on the whole armor of God. And we talked about that before. So when we put on the whole armor of God and we say, oh, the Lord will fight my battle if we let him. Well, we just do not go and lie down and go to sleep and say, the Lord is going to fight my battle. That's why he says, put on the armor. He will fight with us. He does not want us to put down the armor. We have to keep on fighting. Um, the Christians, we need to push back against the forces of evil and darkness. We might be standing against the crowd, but we want to be on the side of what is right. He wants us to contend for the faith. Why is it important to contend for the faith? Why is it so important? Why should we stand up and, and talk to the world and, and let the world know that what we are presenting is right? Because he is depending on us to lead the lost to Christ. 
is very, very important than anything else in the world that we lead sinners to Christ. That's the main reason we are here. Not to build houses, not to make money, not to, that's the real purpose God put us in this life is to win others to him. The other things are important, but we're going to leave all these things behind. But when we stand before God, he's going to ask us, what did you do for me in this life? You know, when the rewards are handed out, we sing, will there be any stars in my crown? How many do you want in your crown? How many are you working for? When we stand before him, can you present somebody to him and say, I led that person to the Lord? He's depending on us, on us to, to lead the lost to him. He also wants us to help to restore those who are fallen. There are many, many backsliders today. And some people might tell you, oh, you don't backslide. Yes, David prayed for the Lord to restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David had lost out with the Lord. And he was a good man. People can lose out. And we, as Christian people, we need to help restore them to the Lord. I could think of very many Probably you can look at these benches and say, oh, this one is to sit here and this one is to sit there. What are we doing to restore them to the Lord? It's our responsibility. The world is not going to help. So it's our responsibility to restore them. Uh, the, word, the, the word of God was taken away from the classrooms. And... Uh, Many times, people will burn Bibles, like they burn the flag. And God is depending on us to be his spokesmen and spokeswomen. He's depending on us. Don't say, I'm too old. Don't say, I cannot talk like, like Moses said when the Lord called him. He said, let Aaron do it. Well, the Lord did not call Aaron to do it. He wanted Moses to do it. You know, we in our church should be very proud that we had a person named August Leff who went all over preaching the gospel. He'll go to every church, Baptist, Nazarene, anyone who calls, he will go because he was preaching God's word so men and women could get in before it is too late. And he stuttered, he stuttered. Yet God used him. God used him in Grenada. God used him other places. But uh, he can sing that song, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? And I know God has stars waiting for Brother August left. I am so thankful that I ever got to know him. And then we stand up for the word so we can help improve morality. The moral standards of this world, we don't have any standards for this world anymore. Used to be that uh, if you did not dress appropriately, you cannot be out in public or you could get arrested. It's not so anymore. You know, you could get naked. I guess most of you heard or, or have seen where they do the tattoos on your body. And, um, and they almost look like you have clothes on. And people are doing that and getting by with it. Um, so we, he's depending on us to, he wants to use us to change this world or do whatever we can, even if we cannot change the person, we can give them something to think about in a nice way, doing it with love, doing it with patience. You can say, honey, that doesn't really look too nice. That does not look appropriate, you know. You can do something like that, but first let me tell you, you have to be led to do it. You don't want to get people annoyed and upset, but still that's contending for the faith. We have to contend for the faith. Um, 
We want to pray that the Lord help us. We are living in a tough time. The devil knows his days are numbered. His time is short. We can tell by the signs of the time, just like the Lord said, it's happening. And he is very, very busy doing how much damage he could get done in the short time. And he says, had it not been for the Lord on our side, the devil can deceive us. We want to be so much in contact with God and so much be led by his Holy Spirit that we can be conquerors in these last days. We do not want to accept defeat. We have to be more than conquerors. We have to stand up for what we believe. And today you hear um, this new committee that is being formed about telling the truth. Well, the committee that is being formed about telling the truth is the committee that tells the most lies. But we as Christian people should not be deceived when they tell you they are telling the truth. Go to the word of God and see what it says about people in the last days. Whereas those who have each ears, those who would not contend for the faith will accept their lies as truth. Folks, God wants to help us as a people. What you have, being saved and being sanctified, hold on to it more than your money, your houses. What you have in here is the most important thing that you can have in this life. It is a pearl of great price. Contend for it. Stand up for it. It might even cause you your death, like these reformers who had to be burned at the stake. But God has eternal rewards for those who contend for the faith. Let us be faithful. Let us be true. Let us not fall away like many others had. I am so thankful for the God that I am serving today. I love him more and more and more. And I want to encourage you to hold on. Amen.